here on in re M B R B and A B. The opposing side has waived, so you will have your um, full 15 minutes to present your argument should you decide to take it. And obviously, there won't be anything to rebut. I will be keeping track of time for you. I'll let you know when you get when there's five minutes left. Sounds good. The argument is being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please keep your voice up and remain behind the podium. Do not use the names of any children. Um, stick with the initials in this case. We've read your briefs, and we are ready to proceed when you are. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you for seeing me early. Um, my name is Dan Leister. I represent the appellate in this case. We are seeking a reversal and a remand based on the January 24, 2019 order issued by the trial court in this case. The effect of that order is essentially a denial of all parental rights to father, denial of all visitation rights to father, full custody of the children, and a lifting of the case plan, essentially removing any kind of requirement to help reunify the kids with the father, to help reunify the family. So it's essentially nothing is in place to help reunify anybody. The children are in sole custody and visitation of the mother, and that's how the court has left it. So the court in his order has stated that you're free to appeal this, that that's the next appropriate step if you want something other than the way that the parental rights are being allocated now. Part of what we're seeking to reverse in that order is also a motion filed by the father, which was filed, it was a motion for visitation, reallocation of parental rights, as well as a modification of the case plan. The crux of that motion and the crux of what the father has wanted throughout the litigation in the case was to address the issue or make an assessment of the issue of parental alienation. A bit of a backdrop, and I know you're not really interested in the facts, but I, I want to make something a little bit clear uh, or reinforce something that I think is important for the court to know, which is that when parental alienation first became an issue with Dr. Amy Baker, Dr. Amy Baker is a parental alienation expert retained by the father. She was originally retained to simply provide guidance to the court, to children's services, to the guardian ad litem. Before she was even designated as a testifying expert, she was a consulting expert that offered a report to apprise all the parties involved of, this is what it is, this is what I think is going on, and I'm free to sit down with anybody who wants to discuss this issue and figure out a way we can modify the case plan. That was never adopted outside of us getting a court order. So when he went into the final trial in July of 2018, the purpose of that was to get the court to force children's services and to force the parties to look into parental alienation as a clinical option to reunify the family. We think that the January 24, 2018 order is simply against the manifest way to the evidence in the case. I, there's a lot going on with this case. It, it has been going on for a long time. But I think for your assistance, I've boiled it down to what I think are the three major pillars as to what has justified the court's order on that date. And the first pillar has to deal with the counseling for the father. The second pillar that a lot of things fall into are the allegations against the father. And the third is the parental alienation basket. I want to start off talking about the counseling. If you read the January 24, 2018 order, one of the reasons the court cites for why the father is being denied his parental rights has to deal with he hasn't made any therapeutic progress on his counseling, something that the court cites in the order. The court also goes on to mention no anger management counseling, no impulse control counseling. This was essentially the first time that the anger management had ever appeared in the case. There were no orders telling the father he needs to get anger management. The case plan's goal was never for him to undergo anger management counseling. The case plan goal, and I quote, was so that the father was able to interact positively with the children. That is what's stated in the case plan, and the case plan is essentially, as you know, is the way that the court effectuates the orders in the case. So according to the case plan, which has the effect of, of a court order, the father was to engage in counseling so that he's able to positively interact with the children. The father did this by going to a gentleman named Jeff Durr. His testimony is cited throughout the briefing. And Jeff Durr testified at the July 2018 trial, and his testimony was that he saw nothing preventing the father from seeing the children. He doesn't see any issues with anger management. He didn't see anything other than he was thrilled. 
I believe his words were, the father went extraordinary efforts to try to see his, his children again. Yet, fast forward to the January 24th order, and we're seeing, well, where was the anger management counseling? And that was a bit of a bait and switch, because there was never an order saying that the father needs to undergo anger management. And I did some research on it, it's in our reply brief. Courts often refuse parental rights because the parent doesn't go through anger management. It happens all the time. If there's a domestic violence accusation, the court says, you need to go to the anger management courses. And a lot of deadbeat dads or deadbeat parents won't get it. They come back to court, they want their kids back, and the court says, you didn't get the anger management I told you to get. In this case, we have the, we have the criticism of the no anger management, but we don't have an actual order or a case plan telling the father he needs to undergo anger management. It's essentially the first time that the father was ever put on notice, and even the father's own counselor was ever put on notice that anger management was something that was expected for the father to undergo. We had a six-day trial, never came up. Uh, I believe this caseworker, Sonia Cole, testified, and she was asked, other than getting the counseling he's gotten and the psychiatric evaluation he's gotten, is there any other objective counseling goals that, from children's services perspective, he needs to get? She said no. There wasn't anything about anger management or impulse control from children's services perspective. Um, and that can be dovetailed into what Dr. Randa Packery had testified. He was the psychiatrist. And the reason that the father went to see the psychiatrist was by court order, was by case management. He was supposed to get a psychiatric evaluation, so he did. If it was in the case management schedule, if it was in the case plan, he did it. And that was one of the things he did. So the father presented the testimony from the two prongs of the counseling. The counselor himself, who saw nothing preventing him from seeing the kids, and the psychiatrist, who said he didn't suffer from any type of mental illness that required any kind of pharmaceutical treatment or any kind of further treatment. Yet, in the order, we see citing to anger management, a failure to make therapeutic progress. And I think what occurred here was the court was parroting something that Children's Services was a narrative that Children's Services has adopted. There's multiple filings by Children's Services where you'll see that language, where the father failed to make therapeutic progress. But again, when the caseworker was testifying at the trial, Ms. Cole had to admit that that statement had nothing to do, it, the information for that statement does not come from anybody who actually counseled or treated the father. So that was a clear, against the manifest way to the evidence. There was no evidence that that order was even in place. There's all the evidence points to the fact that the father went undergo all the counseling he needed to undergo according to the case plan. The, the language in the order doesn't reflect what the order actually was. Just to preempt what I think is likely coming, there were some testimonies about the father's anger at the trial. There absolutely was. And I'm going to address where that comes up. The first time it came up was from the caseworker, Ms. Cole. Ms. Cole testified he was angry at times, he didn't have positive interactions with her. But when pressed, Ms. Cole admitted parents often don't like to interact with children's services, and it wasn't anything out of the ordinary for what she would expect. We also hear some testimony from Mr. Stranathan. Now, Mr. Stranathan was an assistant psychologist who did a two-hour parental, uh, uh, parental assessment of the father. And he mentioned something on the stand about anger. But if you look to what the actual diagnoses were from the parental evaluation that he did, there was never anger management as part of the diagnosis. In fact, when asked on the stand, in terms of the father's counseling, do you, who, what's your opinion on that? He deferred to Jeff Durr, the father's own counselor. So what should have been propped up and what should have been controlling was the actual counselor who did the counseling, who had the ability to control it however the counselor saw fit. The counselor saw that the father needed something in some area. That's something the counselor could have addressed. And it also should be in the hands of the psychiatrist who actually met with the father on four to five different occasions. The only clinically licensed doctor ever to evaluate the father. Those two should have been considered, is he satisfying his counseling goals? Those were not followed. Instead, there's a narrative that he didn't undergo anger management, which we believe is against the manifest way of the evidence. There's simply nothing there to establish that. Counsel, what about um, the recording? Was, was that something the court could consider in regard to um, anger problems or anger issues? So I have that under my second prong, but I think, I think, I think, it's good. I think it, it could apply to prong one. So 
The audio recording, a couple of comments I want to make about the audio recording. The first part of it was, the audio recording was played at a previous hearing. It wasn't the final trial. After that audio recording was played at an earlier hearing, the trial court didn't understand why the kids were acting that way based on the recording. The, the court was puzzled by it. I think the, the judge even said, if I had spoken that way to my parents, I'd still be grounded today. And even the caseworker who testified at that hearing said, the, the kids are, I, I can't understand and explain why the kids are acting this way. In fact, I think the exact language the trial court used when the trial court first heard the audio recording was, there's no logical connection to how these kids are treating their father and to what the claims were against the father. Also, another point I'd like to make in terms of what may have been heard on the audio recording is, sir, um, that was after the rejection had already occurred. So, the, the, it's the cart before the horse. It's the cause and effect. The kids were already in a pure rejection mode of the father at the time that recording was made. So there's no way that what transpired at the recording could have caused the kids to reject their father. Which is really, um, gets me into my second prong, which I think is one of the more important prongs and has some serious due process considerations in it, which are the court referring to things that occurred in the order. The January 24th order is holding father responsible for not protecting his children from quote-unquote things that occurred. What's important to note, there were no sexual abuse, physical abuse allegations pending against the father when the complaint was filed in May of 2017. It simply was not on the table. The very first day of trial in July, the court on the bench stated, we're not going to get into that, that's not shown, that's not a part of this case anymore. Well, counsel, the trial court's order doesn't say anything about sexual abuse. That's correct. That's correct. That's why it's. That's why I phrased this prong as things that occurred. And the trial court said tradition. Correct. Let me ask you this. Sure. If you had the same scenario but for what Grandma did was I'm trying to think of something that would make me endangering for it, um, pouring a bucket of ice water over the child's head. I know that sounds sure. stupid, but let's for whatever reason say that's the tradition. Okay. Child says, I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. Whether dad should stop it, not stop it, I don't know. But did the trial court necessarily abuse its discretion in finding that whatever this tradition was, and I'm taking it completely out of the sexual assault context because it appears that the trial court did, that perhaps there should have been some deference given to the child's feelings about stopping it. Well, there's two parts to this, and it goes in the parental alienation package. What the position of the father was, that this tradition was used as a way to snowball into everything else. That's something that, they, that, they, that, that did occur that was harmless. In fact, there's testimony from the children's own cousins that said, mother used to do that to us in open public. Every, you know, it was just an open tradition. So the fact that the, that the children are now using this tradition as something that they're rejecting their father for, um, and that's why the court, when they first heard the audio recording, said there's no logical connection to this innocuous tradition, even if the kids may have subjectively found it uncomfortable, to a complete pure rejection of the parent. And that's what Dr. Amy Baker explained, to say, let's assume that all these minor things that the kids are saying are true. It does not justify or even explain, from an expert standpoint, how the kids are react to rejecting their father. And it's just the father, specifically. It's not the mother and the father. Because if the court is, 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 says this tradition occurred, there's no criticism, well, the mother failed to protect the kids from, from this tradition, or the, it was only the father. And the reason the court did that is because the father is the only one that the kid is rejecting. And Dr. Baker explained that when you have a child that's actually emotionally abused, that's actually been sexually abused by a parent, they're, never gonna, they're not going to reject the parent the way you see it with alienation. In fact, they might even get closer to, the, to that abusing parent. So the clinical picture is simply not there in terms of this tradition. And all of the, the testimonies about the tradition was, was settled. In fact, in August 1st of 2017, Children's Services, all the claims against the paternal grandmother, were deemed unsubstantiated by their own investigation. And if you look at their definitions for what that means, it means did not occur. So using your analogy of the ice bucket, that would be, that, that would be a good analogy, but what if Children's Services said that the ice bucket incident did not occur? Which is essentially what we have in this case. We have 
Children's Service is doing their own investigation, coming out with a disposition letter saying, the claims against the grandmother were unsubstantiated, did not occur. So that's the backdrop. Counsel, Yet we see the order, I'm sorry? Counsel, I just need to interrupt you for just a second because sure. I don't want to lose this train of thought and I hope I don't cause you to use of course. yours. But in regard to that, you're saying Children's Services Board said, you know, that it did not occur. To the, grand, to the grandmother, yes. But, but my question to you is, and going back to Judge Callahan's analogy with the ice bucket, <clears throat> some people would say that might be child endangerment because the ice is so cold, the water is so cold that it's endangering the child. And somebody can investigate and say, mm, I don't know that it's child endangerment, but it really does bother the kid. And I think that's what Judge Callahan was getting at. Obviously, nobody has said that this was sexual abuse because you have to prove certain factors for sexual abuse. The, um, the water bucket incident could be a cleansing ritual in certain religions, for instance. Okay, so it's not child endangering, but it's still something that the court um, can, can consider, is it not, in regard to the, um, the uncomfortableness of the children and, and how fathers interact. So there's a bit of a conflation in terms of the tradition and what was actually alleged in the complaint in May of 2017. Counsel, you are now over your time. Okay. Because, of that, because of that question, go ahead and answer. Yeah, I'll finish. There's a bit of a conflation between the tradition and what was alleged in the complaint. The complaint in May of 2017 doesn't say the tradition. It says very specific sexual acts by the grandmother touching the kids under their pants and fondling. That was never the tradition. That No reasonable person would think that's the tradition. That's separate from the tradition. That's what we're working off of. So when Children's Services says that's unsubstantiated, that was the basis for deeming them dependent. That was the basis for the whole thing. So when Children's Services says that's, that's unsubstantiated, that should have been the end of it. Yet we look at the order, and now the father's being denied parental rights, parental visitation, for, quote, things that occurred when they were already deemed unsubstantiated by Children's Services in the court. Uh, we didn't get to the third prong, which is parental alienation. We think that's very well briefed in there. I encourage you to read through Amy Baker's testimony. She's very good on this. Um, your time is up. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much um, for your argument. The court will take the matter under advisement. We'll issue a written decision, which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted on our website. And uh, that is the Supreme Court. Be the last of the day. We'll be in recess.